Hi, Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. Confounders can be control for in both the design phase and the analysis phase of a study. In this video, I'm going to discuss how researchers can control confounders during the design phase of an observational study. So confounding is distortion of the effect of exposure on disease by that of a third factor. And confounding can result in over or underestimation of the true effect of exposure on disease. So let's consider a study where we're trying to figure out if hormone replacement therapy is associated with cardiovascular disease. And we're going to ha have to decide whether smoking is a confounder. So for smoking to be a confounder, it has to have several characteristics. One, it has to be associated with the outcome of interest. And we certainly know smoking is associated with cardiovascular disease. It also has to be associated with the exposure. And it has to be unequally distributed between the exposed and unexposed cohorts, meaning that there's a different percentage of smokers in the exposed and unexposed cohorts. And finally, it's not just a link in the causal chain between exposure and outcome. So this is table one of the demographics table of the nurse's health study, an observational study in postmenopausal women looking at hormone replacement therapy and its effects on cardiovascular disease. I have a group of women here who had never used hormones and a group of women who are currently using hormones. And these are three cardiovascular risk factors um, that I'd like you to look at and try to decide if they're confounders. So using the criteria in the previous um, slide, pause the video, think about whether these are confounders, and restart it to see how I answer. So what do you think? Are they confounders? Well, they certainly are. They're unequally distributed between the women who never used hormones and women who do. And on average, the women who never used hormones are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease than the women who are currently using hormones. Well, what about in this study? This is the Women's Health Initiative, a randomized control trial in postmenopausal women of hormone replacement therapy versus placebo and its effects on cardiovascular outcomes. Here are those same three cardiovascular risk factors, and I want you to consider these three confounders in this study. Think about it, pause the video, and restart to see how I answer. So what do you think? Are they confounders? Well, they're not because they're equally distributed between the two arms of the study. And that shows you that randomization is a very powerful tool to control for confounding. So once something is a confounder is equalized between the two groups, it's control for and it's no longer actually a confounder. So confounding can be control for in either the design phase of a study, which is what we're going to focus on in the remainder of this video, or in the analysis phase of a study. There are four ways to control for confounding in the design confounding in the design phase. We're going to go through each of these individually in the remainder of this video. In the analysis phase, largely multivariable analysis is used. I have a previous video that I've made on this. There are other resources to help you understand what multivariable analysis is um, available on the internet. So let's go through each of these design phase tools individually. So let's first focus on randomization. And let's assume the folks here who in red are sicker or at higher risk of an outcome than the people in blue. And what randomization does when each one of these patients presents to the study center, basically a coin flip is done and they each have an equal chance of being assigned to a medical therapy arm or a surgical therapy arm. And you can see the results of randomization is two equalized groups. There's no confounding left. Each of the groups are similar on demographic and clinical risk factors. So confounding is the best way to control for confounding. Uh, excuse me, randomization is the best way to control for confounding. And not only that it controls for known confounders, because I can deal with that easily in the analysis phase, but importantly it controls for things we don't even know about. So we're going to discover new risk factors, and we've seen this in previous studies that had stored sera from years ago. You go back and, for example, look at CRP levels, and even though we didn't understand the role of CRP in the past, you go back to those old stored sera, and CRP levels are equal between the two groups. So the true power of, of randomization is it controls even these unknown confounders. But there's some other tools we can use to control for confounding. So restriction and exclusion are closely tied to each other. And in this, we either allow or we don't allow people with certain characteristics into a study. So for example, if we consider smoking to be a confounder, if we use restriction, we would restrict the study only to non-smokers, or we would exclude smokers. So the result of this is a study full of only non-smokers. So smoking is no longer a confounder in this study. Now the problem is it limits generalizability. So if we want to take the study results and uh, apply them to the broader population, the broader population has smokers in it. So it will limit the generalizability somewhat of our results. Another thing we could do is matching. And so a characteristic 
um, that one patient has who gets in one arm of the study, we match or find that same characteristics in, in another person we put in the other arm of the study. Now we can match on only a handful of things. Once we try to match on lots and lots of things, it becomes very difficult to find a match. So you have to keep that in mind. So for example, if a 60-year-old white smoker is entered into exposed co cohort, we find a 60-year-old white smoker and put them in the non-exposed cohort. And now what I've done by doing this is I've controlled for ethnicity because the white um, group is equal between the two arms. And I've also controlled for smoking because they will be equalized between the two arms. So it's a nice way up front to control for important confounders. And finally, we can do something called stratification. And we might use stratification if we think that a confounder and especially different levels of that confounder have different effects on the relationship between exposure and outcome. So, for example, let's say we're trying to see if there's an association between obesity and diabetes, and we think ethnicity is important. So we might break up our ethnicity in Caucasians, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans, and essentially do small individual cohort studies looking at the association between obesity and diabetes to see if there's a differential effect of these different strata of ethnicity. This video has helped you understand how researchers can control for confounders during the design phase of a study. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the contact me section of my blog. Have a great day.